Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Joe McLean and if you're new here, I do true crime every Thursday and big news. I'm doing them Tuesday now too. I'm super excited. So as you know, if you're still, you're my fans, you come and watch me every Thursday, you know that every Thursday I do a true crime that happened here in Canada. Well, I've been getting a lot of support and request to do uh, another video once, once one more every time every week. Oh my God, what was that? One more time a week. So I'm going to do a video on Tuesdays and call it True, True Crime Tuesdays. Well, I'll be doing the exact same thing. If you guys want to see me do something else, you want some vlogs, you want whatever, let me know. But welcome back. So I'm wondering how everyone's doing. How are you guys doing everything? I hope you guys had a great week or weekend and welcome to True Crime Tuesdays. I'm super excited to do this. So nothing new here in my life. I got some new lighting. I did say last week that I would be moving into my beauty room. Unfortunately, there were some mishaps and stuff that happened and I'm not there yet. So hopefully on Thursday, I'll be filming in my new room. Fingers crossed. We don't know yet though. Um, so I'm back in my living room filming at night, hoping the dog and my husband doesn't interrupt me, but we'll have to see. All right. So let's get into this video. This one's this one's a little different. This one's a little disturbing. Another disclaimer. It's about a uh, hatred towards women, which is something that always happens. And, uh, it's just kind of dark and sad and the outcome, the, what the victims experienced and the outcome of it and how nothing was really happened afterwards. So this one's about Quebec and this was a mass shooting. So if you're from Canada, you probably know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Marc Lepien. Um, I am not French. My husband is, so I try to get him to pronounce some of the words because I was like, I don't know what any of this is, just to figure out what, what they said. So, uh, and just to be able to pronounce the words because, you know, as Canadians, uh, we're um, a bilingual country. So I don't speak any French. I can say bonjour and that's about it. But he speaks it fluently. So here we are. All right. So let's get into this. Let's get into our next, our very first True Crime Tuesday video, and it is about Marc Lepien, so let's get into it. So let's just get straight into it. All right, so Marc was born as Gamal, again, name is going to be here, Gamal Gahabi, don't know how to pronounce that, but I will also toss it again here, um, and he was born of an immigrant named Richard Gahabi, and then of a Canadian woman named Monica Lepien in Montreal and was baptized as a Catholic. I'm also Catholic, but I do not practice. Uh, he spent his early childhood in Costa Rica and Puerto Rico, where his father was a very successful mutual fund um, salesman. But unfortunately, they did have to move back to Montreal, Canada, due to the fact that there was a huge stock market crash and they lost a lot of assets, pretty much all their assets. Gamal, AKA Mark, his father had like a resentment towards women. He did not respect them. Uh, he believed that women were put on this earth to serve men. So if you have any clue about this story, you kind of are getting where Mark got his, uh, his views from. So he was verbally and physically uh, like abusive to the wife and the kids. And at one point he beat Mark so bad that he had bruises on his face that were visible for weeks. So, and he also discouraged Mark's mom to be tender or caring to the children because he said that he would, that's considered spoiling them. So he was not a very nice man. He was not considerate or loving. He just was, you know, it was a very abusive um, relationship that Mark had with his father right off the, like from the jump, right? And he, the dad didn't respect the mom. He didn't have any of that. So he grew up thinking that women were less than him, you know? So when Gamal Mock was seven, his parents separated and they got a divorce in 1976. He lived with his mother 
and younger sister Nadine and um, seeing little to none of his father. And then after a while, his father just stopped coming around or even having contact with the kids. And then he moved abroad. So in 1976, um, Monica, who is Mark's mom, be, um, decided that she was going to go back to school and further her career in education. Um, during this time, Mark and Nadine had to live with family and friends because the mom was going to school and working and they were only able to see their mom on the weekend. So a little, again, like... He wasn't always able to see his mom. There was kind of a disconnect between love there. So the family did go to a psychiatrist just to address like the family's issues that they were having because there was a disconnect of love and affection there. And throughout the um, appointments, they found out that it was very hard for um, Mark to show any type of affection about anything. So in 1976... The mom became the director of nurse of the Montreal Hospital and the family bought and moved to a house in the middle class Montreal suburbs. Um, Gamal attended high school and junior high school there where he was described as quiet and didn't seem to like really have any type of social skills or was social towards the other kids. He was very standoffish, but he did develop a friendship with another boy and but that was pretty much it he didn't really mix with the other kids that well he wasn't really a socialite or even enjoyed being around them or could actually have those characteristics so as mark was growing up he did spend most of his summers um with his um uncle and he was doing like training with him with hunting and stuff so he really enjoyed that. But what he really, really enjoyed was um, the gadgets and stuff that they used. So he would do a lot of electronic and gadgets like that seemed to be like his calling and his thing. But once he got home from school or learning, he, it was straight to cleaning. Right. Look at that. I think I put too much on, but blend, 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 blend. Right. So he would have to come home and do cleaning and um just all the responsibilities of what a man would do in the house because they didn't have a dad and the mom was walking so much. So when he was around seven, he decided that he like insisted that everyone called him Mark because he didn't want to be called Gamal anymore because of the hatred towards his dad. He said his, said his dad was a horrible person and he did not want to have that name and he wanted to be called Mark Lapien. So he told his mom that he had to be called that from now on. So Gamal changed, um, tried to change his name, but he was still too young at that time to really have it changed. And the mom really wasn't, she was too busy to do it. So at that time, Gamal decided that he wanted to join the Canadian Armed Force. And in 1981, at the age of 17, he was rejected. They said that he was antisocial. He was nervous in the interview, um, all that. So he was ejected from joining the armed force and he didn't really like that. He didn't appreciate that. It wasn't, he was kind of pissed off about that. So then he legally changed his name in 1982 when he was 18 and the family moved back to St. Lawrence closer to his mother's work. And he decided that he was going to attend the CEGEP college. He quickly lost touch with all of his school friends when he was doing this and moved back, like moved to that area. The period marks the beginning of seven years, which in his suicide note, he describes is when he started hating his life and he was very unhappy So Mark began a two year pre-university course um, at the St. Lawrence CEGEP University. He failed a couple of them in the first semester, but really like made up in the second semester and actually had very, very good grades. After a year, he switched from the university uh, destination science program to electronic technology, a three-year technical program 
um, where he studied. Um, again, he his teachers remembered him as being like an ideal student because he show up to class, he would do his work, he would get very good marks, and then he was quiet and he didn't really do anything else. Um, however, in February 1986, he the last time he just suddenly without explanation stopped showing up to class so he was just like i'm not going and just randomly stopped and because he stopped going to class he failed um completing his diploma so the teachers kind of thought that was odd but if you've ever been to university they don't care all they want is your money right so he stopped showing up teachers thought it was odd and nothing happened. They never did anything about it. So, so Mark decided that he was going to pick up a job at where his mom worked. She was the director of nurses at a hospital. So he picked up a job as working in the kitchen. A lot of his coworkers kind of said that he was, he was nervous and hyperactive. Um, so he moved out of his mom's home and into his own apartment in the fall of 1986. He applied to study engineering at the um, University of Montreal and he attended conditions, but he had to take, since he failed a couple of courses, he had to take a, diff a couple other courses just to be safe. The university wanted to make sure that he would finish. So he did that. Um, he left his job in the hospital in 1987 and he started taking three courses at the CEGEP um, college, obtaining good marks in all of his courses. So again, he was a very good ideal student. No one had a problem with him. He just seemed to just never be able to finish anything. So at the beginning, he started taking a computer course and at a private school in downtown is where he decided he was going to take that. Let me get a brush out. So he was taking that at a private school down in Montreal and he funded it by um, student loans. He, um, two months later, he decided to move downtown to an apartment that was kind of near his mom's condominium. And in the winter of 1986, Mark took a CEGP night course in the solution of chemistry. Um, and in March of 1986, um, he abandoned the course and the course in the computer program, but he did so well in the CEGP course, obtaining a hundred percent on his final mark. Like the guy was smart and like he could do, like he was a very good student. These are people I want him. And I remember reading somewhere, he said that he never studied for anything and he never, um, he kind of, well, it was in a suicide note. Um, that he never studied for any of these courses and any of these classes and he did so well and I aspired to be that student I would study and study and study and still come out with like a 60 and then I had a really good friend in school who would not study at all and then come to class and then get a hundred and I'm sitting there like I did so much work studying and I got 60 like it just was so frustrating to me and this is one of those people who just like he didn't care. He had a mission that he knew he wanted to do, but he just was like, I'm just going to like not care about these courses, but I'm still going to get a hundred. Like, thank you. So then in August 90, in August, in August, 1986, Mark picked up an application for a firearm um, certification and received his permit in mid October. So on November 21st in 1989, Mark decided that he wanted to pick up a mini semi-automatic rifle at a local shop during this time mark was kind of not acting the same anymore he was seen several times at the university of montreal he brought his mom a present four days before the shooting though it was like several weeks before her birthday he had always been very punctual at paying off his rent but he didn't pay it this time so Something was off with Mark and something was going to go down. So this is, he started acting different, but no one really knew why. But the outcome was not what anyone predicted. So Mark sat in his apartment in East Central uh, Montreal on the afternoon of December 6th. 
checking over his gun, his rifle, his semi-automatic, and he had a bunch of chambers of um, ammunition, and he had a hunting knife, um, and then he was like, okay, hey, I'm going to... I'm going to kill some people today. I don't know if that's exactly what he said, but that's what his thought was, was it's time to shine in his eyes. So he left his apartment in the middle of the afternoon. The sun was already slowly going down because if you're from Canada, you know, you get no sun after four o'clock when it comes to the winter time. So he leaves his apartment. He takes his rifle. He conceals it in a bin liner, a hunting knife that he straps to his belt um, and then he has 30, um, magazines carrying in a bag and there's three boxes of 0.20, uh, 223 bullets stuffed in the pockets of his gray windbreaker. So the sky and the temperature had started to plummet. Mark climbed into his rented car and he decided that he was going to drive to the university. So, so that was an engineering school and that was five kilometers west across the city on the slope of Mount Royal. At the university, William, the federal minister of state of science technology, was in mid-visit. So they were really excited because they had a 19% um, enrollment of women in an engineering school. And this was really big at the time. And they were discussing how to do a federal... Um, scholarship for people for women that was aimed at women to get them more enrolled into a university that specializes in such um, programming like engineering so on the ground floor of the cafeteria there's streamers there's decorations there's everything just because it's the last um day before christmas vacation so everyone's super excited if you've been to university you know like that's like the best time of year like it's, it's super fun, right? Because, like, the semester's over. You walk your butts off all semester to go to school and to do as much as you possibly can and to get the best grades. So when you finally get to go home and see your parents and your, your family, it's awesome. So they're all celebrating this. Um, in the class, the streamers, last day before class. So Barbara, who is a first-year nursing student at the University of Montreal, walks across the cam campus with her husband, Whittold. Um, he's a neurologist. Uh, oh my God. Neuroscientist. Sorry. So he's a neuroscientist. So they had been high school sweethearts and they came to Canada, kind of trying to have like the American dream. Like Canada is such a great place. We can get an education. It's very beautiful there. So that's what their thoughts were. Um, and they were from Swit uh, Poland. Um, and then they headed to the university cafeteria towards 5, 10 p.m. in room 230 on the second floor, a room facing the east. <clears throat> Luke rose from his seat and quietly left um, the mechanical engineering class to pay a visit to the lavatory. And the lavatory is the bathroom. So as he headed down the corridor, he passed a man who appeared to be in his early 20s carrying a bin liner and wearing a baseball cap. In room uh, 2.30, Professor Vaughn and Adrian sat listening to an oral presentation by two of their students. In the corridor, Mark slid the Ruger, which is a gun, out of the bin liner. Prof um, Vaughn failed to see anyone enter the room but became aware of like an alien presence. Like I think if you're in a small um, university, you know that like you kind of get to know your class, you kind of get to know who everyone is. So when somebody new kind of comes in, it's kind of like, who's this, you know? Like, why is this guy here? But those oral presentations, those people moving on around. So it is kind of hard to like really like pinpoint who your students are. If you're in a big university, you're a number and you're not a name, no, profs or anything care for you they just want your money and to get you in and out right they're too busy so then he started to notice that there was somebody in the room and mark took his gun out and just started to demand that everyone stopped everything what they were doing 
And then the angle to within two or three feet of the students was the people giving the presentation. So they were in like the most immediate danger. So one of the pair, Mock, noticed that Eric was smiling the whole... No, so Eric was one of the people and he noticed that Mock was smiling the whole entire time. And he was very calm. So many of the 60 strong class thought the gunman was like a year end prank, you know, like... Oh, you guys got us. Ha ha ha. Right? So that's what everyone was thinking, that he was just like a, a joke kind of thing. Um, and they were laughing at him because they all thought it was a joke. And then Mock decided that he was going to shoot the ceiling and address the class. And he said, separate yourselves. So he told them that they needed to separate. So he said... I want boys to the right and I want girls to the left. And then nobody moved. So Perry, who was there, thought the shot was a blank and Mark repeated the order aggressively again. And he started putting authority into his voice. So then that's when people were kind of like, okay, maybe this guy's actually like, he's serious this time. So um, they started getting nervous and students were on the edge. So they were like hiding behind pillows and stuff because it was a gunshot going off. And in the confusion, the males and the females became mixed into two groups. He repeated his demands and then the, man, the men started to get out of the room and started going to the right and the girls started going to the left. Eventually, the students were divided um, as he wanted. And he said, OK, guys leave and girls can stay. Um, the men, the male students finally decided to like, they were, they were getting like escorted out by Mark and, um, he told them to move their asses cause he was going too slow and still unsure. Like the guys had no clue what was going on. Right. Like this guy came in, shot at the ceiling and was like, okay, guys get out. And so no one really knows what's going on. Right. So they're slowly moving and they don't really know what's going on. So then when the last man eventually left um mark turned to the nine females of the engineering majors who will remain there and he was in the position between them and the door and then he like he asked them do you know why i came here and one of the ladies natalia said no and mark goes i'm here to fight against feminism and Natalia is like, look, we're women studying engineering. We're just students. We just live a normal life. We're not all feminists. And then Mark yells, you're a bunch of feminists and open fires. He sprayed the group of the nine women left to right, emptying pretty much his whole gun out on them. And then he, um, so the bodies, he, so it was like 20, 30 shots he did into the bodies Natalia uh, was wounded. She got shot in the lower leg and a bullet grazed her upper left eye. She was one of the luckier ones because six of her classmates fell dead. The average age of these women were 21 and the cause of death ranged from being shot directly into the head to uh, hemorrhaging from nine bullets to ricocheting bullets. He op like the, the men outside heard this happening and they just, they left. They were like, no, thank you. We are good. We are out. So they all decided to peace. As this was, so as this was going on, Mark decided to, after he was done with the women, he thought he killed them all and he was, he was out of there, right? So then he decided that he was going to start second, stalking the second floor corridor. He turned the corner and was faced 30 meters away from a group of people smiling around a block of copiers, like photocopiers. So Mark opens fire on them and three people stuff fell to the floor wounded. Eric, who was lingering down the far end of the hall of the corridor, now fled from uh, for the stairs. Another student in the vicinity did likewise. Mark advanced past the photocopiers in a classic, um, why can't I say this now? military style where he had his like back to the wall like scoring had his gun and then he was like opening fire on them right so he knew what he was doing and he came there for a mission which was really 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 sad for them um 
So there was a phone call at this point where somebody was saying there's hostages, there's a man opening fire, there's lots of people wounded to the force 911 call. And this was about 512 when they decided to call that there was a man in here who had a gun and who was doing, who was shooting people and no one knew what was going on. So once this call came in, then a flood of calls came in afterwards. And so remember the time, okay? It is now um, 5.12. So it is now 5.12 that the first 911 phone call happened, okay? Remember this. This is, this is important for the ending. So the first 911 calls. So the finance... Um, so in the finance department, Macy hurried to lock the door because she could hear the guns. She could hear the firing. She could hear something was going on. So she went to go lock the door. But Mark was stalking up the corridor and turned and came trotting down. So he saw her, which was unfortunate. He aimed through the window, which unfortunately was like dead set on Macy's head. And he shot her and it went straight through her skull. And then Mark returned um to the deserted second floor and stepped onto the escalator so he could walk his way down so he started from the top and now he's walking his way down to get everyone else so in the ground floor of the cafeteria this is where wilt and his wife was a uh, will told was if you guys remember me talking about him he is the polish guy with his wife so they are here now at the cafeteria, they're trying to get some food. So this was one of the things that I noticed with this story. I was like, does no one hear this going on? Cause like, it just seems like so casual. I've never been in a shooting. I've been around a gun um, for hunting reasons and stuff, but it just seems like everyone was like, the, the guy's shooting up upstairs and everyone's just going along doing their day, like nothing's going on. And I was like, no one hears any of this. So he was downstairs trying to get some food. His wife, Barbara, already had her tray filled and she paid the cashier. Where suddenly people just saw it come running and no one knew what was going on. They pushed Wilt into the cafeteria kitchen and then they slammed the door shut. And he laid on the floor with the others and tried to work out what was happening. And the chef stood there with a knife. So meanwhile, a, two, a 0 0.223 caliber bullet entered Barbara's lower back. Uh, lacerated her left kidney, her appendix, her spleen, her diaphragm, liver, heart, and left lung, fractured her sixth and seventh rib, and then exited through her left breast. So she was shot. He didn't even know this, that his wife was shot because he's now in um, the kitchen with, the, with everyone else. And he thought that there was like a stick up or a robbery going on at the kitchen. And this is why everyone was freaking out. Little did he know that his wife was already dead outside. He just assumed it was just a stick up. So Mark is now strolling the cafeteria, firing shots at, at Will. Like anyone who comes near him, he's just shooting them. He doesn't care at this point. Um, those who had fled and... Um, got out okay and those who were in the cafeteria were now like trying to cover themselves with um plastic chairs laminated tables by the time mark left the cafeteria um at the door at the far end two young women lay dead and one other girl was severely wounded and then he went off to search for more people um the first two police vehicles finally arrive at the university and they were joined by another vehicle that was like a campus police officer. So in the absence of the senior police officer, an officer in one vehicle took charge positioning vehicles at each exit. So the southeast and southwest side and the northwest side of the building. Um, so there was no tactical unit. There was no scene of crime team. There was no commander or even an ambulance hasn't even arrived at this point. So they're just kind of like free balling it, right? It, I don't know why it took so long, but so there's still not even everyone there. Suddenly a mock, mock appeared on the third floor, shooting and wounding three students. Um, down the corridor, there was an engineer class going on at the time and they were doing oral presentations. Um, Eric was in this class. Eric 
Uh, Macy and Roger were giving an oral presentation at this time. Suddenly, Mark appeared and decided that he was going to just start shooting this place up. So he went down the corridor into the engineering class. And at the front, there was Mark, Macy, and Roger. They paused for a moment and they were listening because before Mark got there, they could hear something going on. But they said, um, if you're not familiar with um, machine guns or not machine guns, I guess semi-automatic guns, or you've never been around one, you kind of don't understand what they sound like. So it was in the distance, so they didn't know what was going on and they couldn't really hear anything. A short while later, this is when Mark came in and decided that he this was like his where he was going to shoot everyone up. So Mark came in, um, burst open the door and entered the with the rifle. Eric was like right there, so immediate danger, right? And the gun in Mark's hand, he said, could have been a toy. He wasn't too sure. Again, it was the last day of school. Everyone kind of thought this was like a joke. He was joking. This couldn't be real. So they did, they just thought that's what it was. They thought, oh, this guy's a joke again. Little did they know that he just killed like 14 people or how many people were downstairs. So they thought this was like kind of like a funny joke. It wasn't. So he comes in with his gun. Um, and he starts screaming at them, yelling at them, get out, get out, and shot and wounded um, Macy. Um, Eric and Roger with the two other professionals scrambled for cover. Mark shifted his stance and then just started shooting everyone that was up in the rows that were listening to it. He started doing, um, he targeted all the women and he targeted these two girls who were working together. They worked together all semester on this one project. And now they are dead together because he decided to go after them, which I thought was really sad. Again, Mark was doing this because he didn't like women. So he just decided that he was going to kill them all. So they died together. Um, then Mark began tracking down, going up and down the aisles, looking for people um, in the room, firing between the rows. In the desk, four students were hit. Roger said he spotted one of his classmates, Anna, between the rows, five and six, moaning, crying for help. She was bleeding and she was shot twice in the upper body. I don't know, like, that would be mortifying. Even the guys who, like, uh, Mark wasn't really after guys, but I think like that would be mortifying to see. I think I just got black on my face now. If you knew all these people, like you're in these classes with them for so long, you're doing a whole semester with them, you kind of get to know them, and then this guy comes in and just starts shooting everyone up, and you don't know what's going on. Like that would be that would be so scary. Hi everyone, I'm just popping on here to say that there is a break. Um, my mother-in-law saw it, and I didn't catch it when I was editing that between, I think it's 33 and 35, it goes mute. So I'm gonna put the time when it goes back right here. Um, I'm gonna split the video and make sure that I do tell you because the story, because it'd be kinda, you don't know what happened between that part, right? It got crazy, Mark came in, started shooting the place up, and then all of a sudden mute, right? So in that part, it pretty much, I was just saying is, um, so I think it was Mercy. So she's laying bleeding on the floor at this point. Um, she's been in that position since Mark came in and started firing. Um, when Mark first came in, the first person he shot was Mercy. And so she's still laying there bleeding. I guess Mark decided to go to the floor where she was and he brought out his uh, hunting knife and just started stabbing her. So he stabbed her three times and at one point it did hit her heart and killed her but she was screaming no 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 and she was gulping and moaning and screaming for help um it was it was pretty sad so that's the part you kind of missed about him shooting and eric also was saying that you weren't able to lift your head up because if you did you probably would have got hit by a bullet so Ma eric was just laying directly on the ground like that hoping that the shooting would stop and then it did 
And then after Mark finished with uh, Mercy, he put the knife down on the table and that's where it picks up again. So I'm just coming on here to let you guys know that I messed up, it happens in YouTube, but I'm just, I'm just here to, I'm going to put this in, this little export, and again, I'll put the time when it comes back and when it stops. So if you just want to skip ahead, I'm going to put it right before it stops. So if you want to skip ahead to this time right here, um, then it goes back to the story. So I'm again, sorry about this. Hopefully I catch it next time and hopefully it doesn't happen again. All right. Bye. So at this point, Mark drew a deep breath and calmly put the knife down because he was done stabbing her on the professor's desk. Together in two boxes, there were cartridges, and he put down his baseball hat. He sat down and took off his uh, windbreaker, and when he took down his windbreaker, Eric said that he saw that there was a skate rigs. Uh skate rag sweater that he was wearing and it said death head mafia he wrapped the windbreaker around his gun and then put the gun to his head and shot himself they said that you could hear him mutter oh shit those who were watching saw him blow his skull off so mock killed himself and it was not yet five 30, so it only took 20 minutes for Mark to do this rampage. So outside, in the freezing, drizzling rain, police finally showed up. They had 17 vehicles and the, there was 27 officers. So they finally get there 20 minutes later after all these people die. They got there. Perfect. So they finally get there. And start taking charge. And then they hear like the gunman killed himself. So then they finally let a policeman go into the building. Um, so at this point, Whit told left the cafeteria kitchen and escaped through a fire exit. Um, still under the impression that this was still just somebody who tried to rob the cafeteria. That there wasn't a mass murderer going around shooting everyone. So he tried to get back into the building but he wasn't allowed to until the middle of the night. And that's when he found his dead wife. So he found Barbara. She was still a little bit warm, he said, because it wasn't too long after the, um, the murder. 
or the shooting that he was allowed to go back in and he was just I guess like heartbroken which it's my opinion I think anybody would be if they came in and they saw that the wife was shot down right so he was heartbroken um he said that they went to Canada because they thought it was the safest country and that they thought they were going to start over with their life and if they even thought that something like this could happen in Canada, that they would have just went to Switzerland or Germany. So the question about this rampage that Mark had is his actions are a three are in a three-page suicide note of how much he hates women and how he hated his life ever since women started taking over. Um, is kind of like one of the reasons why people question this whole case or why they found it so interesting because... He blamed feminists for spoiling his life, threw into shop relief a number of quality issues that were unsettling. They include um, how the extent to which the act reflected a society in which many women suffer through violence at the hands of men anyways, how he reached the conclusion that simply, simply to the females who died that he killed it was justified because they were women. He was able to do that just because he they were women. How a clear disturbed man was able to obtain a lethal weapon like that. Who was clearly having some sort of mental break. And then could kill those people. So the tragedy brought the details to light on his troubling childhood. Because <clears throat> they said that he was abused as a child. Not saying that that's okay um, of what he did. Um... I just think like he justified the whole thing of him being him hating women and that's why he did it and how he was allowed to do it. Um, I'll give you my final thoughts in a second. I'm just going to put some lashes on and I'll come right back. All right, I'm back. I put my lashes on. So now it's time for my final thoughts about what I thought about this case. So I find it, I like to give you guys a little bit of the backstory of how they grew up just so you like understand that he did have some trauma in his life. He did suffer um he was abused as a child but does that make what he did right no so that's always like my thing this case another one good good work on the rcmp for coming i don't know if they're the rcmp in quebec they might just have quebec police but good work for them to show up like someone's calling there's a guy shooting the place up and they're like eh we'll get there when we get there and then not let anyone in and then wait until the guy kills himself after he just like went through everywhere like that got me I was like come on just do better you know just do better and then he had a three-page suicide note that they found in his pocket that if you're interested go look it up yourself I will not be writing or reading it because I think that's inappropriate like he doesn't need any more publicity than what he already got um it was actually horrible what he did and how he just pinpointed the women. I I think it was a horrible case. I think what he did was wrong. Um, he clearly had some sort of malice towards them. He clearly had some sort of issue towards women, even though the only person who, a parent who actually like decided that they cared about him was the mother. So for him to have such hatred towards his mom and not towards like somebody who perceived to be ideal like his dad, kind of like threw me because... I don't know why I knew he grew up with his dad's views of his dad saying that women are supposed to just be supposed to be in the kitchen and aren't she supposed to be in the kitchen and not have a job well that's not how it is right so it's it's tough like when that stuff happens and like when you read about it like I I get where he came from when he grew up as having the views his dad had not I don't get what he did because he shouldn't have done that but my thoughts are just like, the the other thing that gets me with this case is the parents of the victims now have no justice because he took his own life. So he went and killed everyone and then killed himself. So what do the parents get? What do the victims, significant others or anything, get out of it? They can't even have a trial or get this guy to actually have justice for what he did because he decided that he was going to take the quickest way out and just kill himself after he killed all these people, which I think is just come on like really you had to do that to them like that is the one thing that I feel horrible about the families for is now they get no justice whatsoever because he took his life 
So there is a Canadian day. It's called the National Day of Remembrance of Action on Violence Against Women. And that was implemented after this happened. Um, I just think this was a super sad case. And either way you look at it, it was a lose-lose for everyone. Like, he killed himself. There's going to be no justice. The women died for nothing. There was obviously some sort of type of uh, resentment towards women that I don't understand. And he didn't really get at. He just said he hated feminism. So... Those are my thoughts on this case. I want to know what you guys think. This one was a pretty big one when it hit Canada. It was a pretty disturbing case. And reading like the first encounters of what happened and having like Eric's point of view when he saw his friend dying and then getting stabbed and then Mark just being like, time to kill myself and just kill himself and just leaving the men. I want to know what you guys think about this because I thought it was pretty crazy. Um, It was just like, it was a crazy, it was a crazy story when it happened. I wasn't alive when he did this, but... It, I still remember it to this day. I know I'm obsessed with all this stuff, so I'm obviously going to look into it. But I want to know what you guys think. If, do you guys think the RCMP or the police of Quebec reacted the way that they were supposed to? Do you think there was an underlying mental health issue going on with Mark? Do you think... What was the reason he did this? What do you guys think? I want to know. You guys know my thoughts, so I want to know your guys' thoughts. So I just want to say thank you again for everyone who is coming, who is giving me the love and support, who has been subscribing and watching my videos. It just means so much to you. I got 70 subscribers now, and like to most people, they're going to be like, that's not much. To me, that means there's a lot of people out there that are actually enjoying what I'm doing, and I'm trying to get better. I got a new um soft light that I'm using now and I'm I got a microphone and I'm trying my hardest to give you guys the best content out there and I'm super excited to get my makeup room and my beauty room all made for you guys but again if you guys really enjoyed this video please like and subscribe and I'll be putting my socials down below so you guys feel free to follow me on those things see up and coming things that I do I did a giveaway last week um hopefully I get to do another giveaway if I reach a hundred uh subscribers so Tell your friends, share this video, get my name out there. I love it. I love doing this for you guys. This is my passion project and I'm just so happy that you guys are really enjoying it. So again, like and subscribe and tell me if there's anything you guys want me to do a little bit different. If you guys want me to show something, show more makeup, do whatever, like let me know down below. Give me some feedback. I would love to hear about it. I just really want to say thank you guys again. This means a world for me. The support I've been getting is just awesome. You guys are awesome. This is why I do it. I do it for you guys. So thank you guys so much for the support. And yeah, like and subscribe and do whatever you guys got to do. Let me know what you guys think. All right, guys. So that was the first ever True Crime Tuesday. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. So let me know. All right. I will see you guys on Thursday. See you real soon. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone.